Hi, my name is Chad Mark Manny. And that was a voice that wasn't exactly natural. And I want to try an experiment. I had this idea last night. Today is the 6th of October, 2024. And I had a little bit of a different idea to just tell my story. It isn't having to do with, oh, look at me, how interesting and how great I am, or that you should care, or that you should learn something from any of it. But some people might, because I've always said this, or, you know, recently I've said this, that I've been everything once. Now, of course, I don't mean that literally. I mean, I'm an American, um, so of course I haven't been... <laughs> Everything and every... Oh, this is ridiculous. See this is how ridiculous you can get when you are so used to trying to fit the norms. I've written some books. I've done so many posts, so many talks. And I'm always trying to share some kind of conclusions, some kind of philosophies, um, opinions about things or, you know, the usual. But... Nobody seems to ever talk about their story, their life story. And I think what holds people back is maybe that there is that to be totally honest isn't isn't it doesn't feel like it's allowed. It's not really permitted in most people's lives. And it's scary to the person telling the truth and just as scary to the people around you, the people who've been part of your life. But I, for me, honesty is everything. For me, telling the truth is the same thing. And here I go, preaching. Here I go with conclusions. Why don't we just jump into it? So the idea here is, I'm not going to edit this. If I go off course, I, I, I correct myself as I just did or attempted to. And I am going to just record as long as I want to, starting from the beginning, and and then continue on whenever I feel like doing it again, and just kind of post it one by one. I'm not sure how long this is going to take. I have no goal or objective, but over the past many years, whenever I'm, I talk to somebody new or I try to get to know someone, um, they're always asking me my story. And I've always found it kind of annoying because I don't want to repeat my story or I don't I think that telling your story or the story of me certainly is an ego thing, any kind of identity thing. And so I've always been very uncomfortable um talking more than the other person, right? Talking about me 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 naturally, which we sh we all should be uncomfortable about that. And but then I realized, you know, if people are asking for my story based on getting to know me a little bit, um Maybe there's something there. And I just had the idea last night, after drinking a bit too much wine, after being at the water park all day, um, what about just starting from the beginning, taking my time, and one time, just telling the whole story to the best of my ability. So, I'm not going to bore you with, oh, my first memory was how I sat on my big wheel <laughs> and looked into the forest and conscience. I just consciously decided to have my first memory. Um, that would be kind of silly to talk about, you know, uh, every detail as I go along. I, I, so I try to relate to having something meaningful or interesting or funny and try to explain what happened. Why, when I went on this, this course or this track, you know, I chase things for a long time and something changes and I go on a different track. Why? What happened? So let's just get started. Um, I grew up, I was born in Wapaka, Wisconsin, a small town, about 5,000 people, right in the middle of Wisconsin. All the, I guess, all the sort of cliches we have about the Midwest from the movies and everything else. It was pretty much, pretty much how it was. I was born in 1974 and... 
So yeah, late you know the late seventies and then really the eighties being my my childhood. Um, I don't have many memories, uh, you know, during the seventies. But of course, you know, I was four, five, six years old. But you know, growing up in Ronald's Ronald Reagan's America. So, just just to give you an idea of my childhood. So my my dad um, has a pretty severe disability. He has cerebral palsy, which severely affects his speech and his his hand and god which hand is it his right hand and that tells you tells you that you know i don't get to see him that much anymore he's still he's still alive um and he was fortunate enough in the old america to get a pretty good job he he was a custodian he took care of banks he took care of one bank for i think it was like 30 years as their only janitor, custodian, maintenance guy, basically. He did everything with his one hand and his bad back. And he worked overtime. He got up so early. He got up when it was still dark outside every day. He would come home at about 10 o'clock in the morning and take a nap, have lunch, and then go back to work um, until 7. And so he worked really hard, at least 50, 55 hours a week. Um, my mom was... Severely obese, um, not too unusual, I guess. But um, she was also a hard worker. Kind of had had part time jobs, but she wasn't working all the time. I think she would much rather take care of her kids. Um, I'm, I'm an older brother. My my brother is two years younger. His name is Travis, and we were happy kids. I mean, we were normal. All American, I guess, you know, happy kids. We grew up um, in a ranch house that my my dad, you know, on, on this on this type of job, he was able to buy land, able to get a mortgage for a house. We had, we had our own rooms. Um, it was kind of in a swamp. It was there was a swamp around us, and we, and we were kind of on a raised part on a hill in the swamp, with a driveway going through. So there's a lot of mosquitoes and stuff, and. Um, my grandparents lived next door. Well, next door being like, like um, a quarter mile away, a, a decent walk away. But the next house down, either through the swamp or on the or on the highway, or on the yeah the highway. Um, <clears throat> not really a highway, like a a two lane sort of highway, and we were very close to my my grandparents. Um, my grandpa was was much older than what would be normal. Um, he made false teeth. He was retired by the time my first memory of him was he was already retired. But he made false teeth in, in his basement and had some contracts and and that's how he made he made a living his 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 life. He didn't get married to my grandma until he was in his forties. And we don't know the story of his life. And you know, I guess I guess what matters about a person is what was what they are to you and what you see in a person or your experiences and your shared love with a person. And he was, you know, he was everything to me, um, as, as, as my, my mom and dad were, are, um, my grandma, she, she was a nurse. She retired when I was about five or six, but she was, she was a nurse. So they, they made a really good living. They, they bought a, a farm and they had a barn and they had, when they were, when they were younger, they had animals, they had a horse and things, and they had all kinds of toys, like, like all kinds of a sleigh and, and riding lawnmower. And there was a river going, going in the back of their property. And my grandma used to love to fish. Um, I went out with her to fish for trout on the river. We sat on a bridge. We had a bridge going across the river to the, to the other part of their land. And we would just sit on the bridge and stick the line in the water. Um, Sports were a big part of my life. Uh, probably not too young, but you know, we, we would go over to my grandparents' house for Sunday dinner just about every week. And we'd come a little bit early and we'd, we'd at least my brother and I would come early and we'd play some baseball outside. Uh, we'd play we'd play football, we'd throw football around. My dad would join us sometimes and play quarterback. 
we played catch all the time. And so we play outside and, or, or if it was a, you know, football season to watch the Packers on a Sunday, that was, that was the best, really the best kind of a day is to go over there and or go to church in the morning. Right. So I'll get to that next, but we go to church in the morning and everybody knows who knows you, you know, everybody and, and everyone's talking about the Packer game and the way out of church. And, um, we go home and watch it together and, and, then go out and play some sports and then my mom and dad would come over and my grandparents would make some appetizers and we'd, we'd have some some good old-fashioned 1950s style crackers and cheese and and dip and veg, veggies and and herring and all kinds of all kinds of appetizers shrimp even <laughs> and then we'd have chicken dinner every every week we'd have chicken dinner we'd have you know apple pie she'd make some dessert and that was so that's a good, it gives you kind of an idea what my childhood was like. Conservatives, Republicans, um, I knew very well the good old-fashioned American values. Um, America was, of course, the best country in the world. Um, God's, you know, we lived in God's country. And the flag was the greatest symbol of freedom in the world and our country was good and Russia the USSR was the enemy and it was bad and that and that's of course that's true because one country has freedom freedom of speech and prosperity and opportunity and the communist bloc didn't have any of that so it all made sense the whole world made pretty much made sense um we went to church. It wasn't. We weren't like fanatically religious, but we went to church. We were Episcopalian. So if you don't know what that is, it's kind of like like a Catholic ceremony, very very similar. Just the only difference really being that you're not that the Pope isn't your Pope. Um, but otherwise, it's kind of the same thing. So very dry. Very you know, children behave. Sit still. Be quiet. Sit stand. Sit stand. Kneel. Um, longs long service for a kid to get through and and then you go home and, and do your thing um, when I by the way it's kind of a side note there when I when I was older when I was a teenager I became an altar boy so I I volunteered to like help the help the pastor go in, in the back of the I don't I don't know the terminology anymore as you can probably tell I'm not religious uh, now um, but we would go back and do all the sacraments and and get everything ready and stand on the altar with him. And I remember one time in the summer, it was so hot, I had this robe on, this red robe, and it was so hot, of course, no, no air conditioning in a church, and I'm just dying. And and suddenly, I'm standing there, and everything goes white, and I just collapse right on right the altar, just passed passed out right on the altar. Um, but anyway, I don't want to, I really don't want to bore you um, you know, with every detail about my childhood, I think I think there yeah you know, there were there were no real struggles. It was just the normal stuff. I remember silly things like like the Halloweens and the and the Thanksgivings. Everything just they were I guess trying to do things the all American way. We had we had an old fashioned nineteen forties fridge in the garage with with Ting soda. It was called Ting with all kinds of fruity flavors of soda that we could just help ourselves to whenever we were thirsty. Um, we, had, we drank a lot of sugar. We had Kool-Aid in the fridge all the time. And we had soda at grandparents. And we had a pool room in the garage. We'd play a lot of billiards with grandma and grandpa. Yeah, I guess a lot of my memories were with grandma and grandpa because my parents were, were, were so busy with, well, being parents and working. Um, we had a boat when when I was... I don't know how old, fifth grade, fourth, fifth grade. We had an old, rundown, ugly 1950s, probably green boat, and we we had really I really loved going out boating with my my mom and dad and and going to the lakes for for the day. We'd park it and and swim and and just there's like thousands of people on the chain on the chain of lakes in Wapaka. and amazing stuff. I didn't really intend to go this fast to get through my whole childhood that quickly. 
But I think I'll leave it at that for now. I might come back to some of that if it, if it feels more relevant later. And so, so at some point, um, at the summer before seventh grade, I became super passionate about playing basketball. Like I said, I was, I was always watching sports, uh, football, baseball, basketball. And for some reason, I, I kind of took to basketball. I went to Little League, played baseball. And I played every sport, you know, or I tried, I tried to be part of the team. And I was never very good. I was a little bit overweight. I think all the, all the sugary drinks were making me a little bit overweight as a kid. I was you know, chubby at, at, in fifth grade, sixth grade. But then I went to basketball camp, the first basketball camp, and the high school coach showed us how to properly shoot. And something just kind of clicked. Like I was, if you can just start using a form and look like you know what you're doing and make, and make a good portion of your shots, it's kind of fun. And I started to really love basketball. And my, and my grandparents took half the barn and cleared it out and put up a basketball hoop. So I had an indoor basketball court. We put a spotlight up if it was dark. And it wasn't perfect, but you know, it was the measurements were there and there was a, a three-point line and, and so forth, and a free throw line. And I just fell in love with the whole idea of going out to that barn and bouncing the ball around and the, and the sound, you can imagine, like it's like a plywood floor. And it was an old dirty barn. You'd go in through the the base, the downstairs, the basement of the barn, I guess you could call it, with old tools from like the fifties, and you know, dirty and cobwebs everywhere, creaky. And up the stairs into that into that main section, I'd plug in, I'd plug in the spotlight, and come up there and just see this beautiful lit up court. And it was to me just dreams. I had an old boombox radio there, and I listened to the radio, whatever was popular at the time, and and music wasn't bad back then. It was really good actually in the '80s, even the radio. And sometimes when I got when I got better at basketball, and a lot of this was kind of on my own. I mean, I, my brother didn't; he wasn't as as ambitious. He'd come home from school and he would he would watch the sit the reruns of the I don't know the old sitcoms the. Jeez, I love Lucy or or something like that or the Beverly Hillbillies or <laughs> I can't even think of the names, you know, the uh, Happy Days and all this stuff. And he would just sit there and eat Twinkies and, and watch that with Grandma. And I would have my Twinkie <laughs> and I would go to the barn for hours. And I started getting really good at basketball, just shooting and dribbling around, doing the ball handling stuff and, and the basic, you know, tr- uh, training and then I started, you know, I played my brother and my dad. I could finally beat my dad, at, you know, pretty quickly because he was getting older. And he, he, he was never very good, of course. And and then, of course, the next step is you join. And I was, I got really good, actually, in a short amount of time. Like, I was making every shot. I remember, I remember before seventh grade, I had just started playing. I was only, like, probably five or six months into taking basketball seriously. And to do that, you've got to practice, like, every single day. I mean, a day off is a huge exception. You're sick or something. And at least two hours, more like three, two or two and a half or, or so. Even, I mean, to be any good at the sport, it's one of the hardest sports to become really good at because there's so many things to practice. All the different shots, moving this way, moving that way, you know, from far from the hoop or, or, or layups or, or free throws. And then, of course, the ball handling. And there's so many elements that you have to work on that it takes literally hours every single day to be any good but i i had big dreams i was going to the nba i mean pretty quickly i saw that i could do it i saw how fast i was improving and i started having dreams that made chills go down my spine and i think a lot of well, a lot of the chills are probably the fact that it was freezing outside. We're in Wisconsin, and I said every day of the year, I mean in the winter. I would go out there when in the snow and have some gloves on to start the first five minutes and, and a hat and, and bundled up with my jacket and everything else. Still freezing. It's still Wisconsin. 
but you start running around and you start sweating and then you get chills down your spine because you're sweating and it's so cold. But I did that every day or after school until my my mom or dad came to pick me up uh, on their way home from work late, 6 p.m. or something like that. And I remember playing the high school varsity guys, the, some of the better players, one-on-one or two-on-two, and I was kicking their ass. I really was. And I, I just had started the game. I was making shots they couldn't make. I was doing things they couldn't do. And I started feeling really, really good about basketball, and I just was dreaming about playing in the NBA. Why not? And I had the energy, and I was and I was doing the work. I was doing so much work that I caused a pretty severe injury. Both my knees had huge lumps on just beneath the kneecap, the bone there underneath your knee. I had massive lumps growing bigger and bigger every day. And I wouldn't stop playing. I thought, I'll just work through it. I read some kind of a book about basketball, this basketball player. I forgot who it was, Oscar Robinson or something. And he said, you got to fight through every pain and, and your body hurts. you got to keep going. So I took that literally. And I didn't recover from the injuries. And no one told me otherwise. No one knew what they were. No one knew anything about the path that I was on. So I kept going and until I couldn't walk. And I went to the doctor and I thought, okay, a couple of weeks off. Well, he said, no, this is pretty serious. It's called Osgood Schlatter's disease, common um, amongst basketball players who are growing rapidly. I was growing super fast at the time, seventh grade. And what ended up happening is I missed the entire seventh grade season. The first, you know, the the real sort of competitive league, the school team that that I was going to, I was going to like raise some eyebrows with, with, I would have dominated every game with that talent, but I didn't play. And I don't think I ever got back into the form. I mean, not, I mean, maybe it's just in my, in my imagination, but I don't think I was ever as good of a shooter or ball handler or basketball player that, that I was that very first year. So you can imagine the amount of hard work and dedication. And that's, I guess, what I learned from it. It's just to be able to do that kind of hard work day after day. But to enjoy it, to dream. And it wasn't it wasn't too hard to dream back in 1980s America and the Midwest and God's country. Um, everything made sense. Didn't question anything. Nobody questioned anything. Um, everybody having a good time. Um... And then, so I missed that season, and I went back at it, but it really took, I grew so much, my body had changed, my my strength wasn't what it was, and it took me a long time to even get back to where I was, and of course, then I was growing taller, so eventually, a year or two later, I could start dunking, and, and I kept working at basketball. My parents built a new house. I don't want to bore anybody with this story, but just to say, we moved from the swamp up to the hill, um, across the river from my grandparents, so I would go... This, now I could go home and back and forth with my grandparents across this, the, our bridge. And we, we had a basketball court up there as well, a cement, you know, outside classic driveway basketball court there. So I'd, I'd put in the work every day. It doesn't matter if it's middle of July and I'm out there sweating in, in 95 degrees Fahrenheit and, and just doing the work. Not perfect. You know, I could have done things better. I could have shot less and done different kinds of drills. I, I wasn't coached that well at all. And um, I, I'll just kind of end, you know, end the basketball part for now that I kind of went on to, yeah, I made varsity and as a sophomore. I averaged 18 points a game, which is really good for a sophomore. Um, my best season was the sophomore season, which is kind of sad. I don't know what happened. I wasn't, I think it was, I'm rushing the story. I don't want to rush anything. You can skip ahead if, that, if, that's, if that's what has to happen. And, and I don't even know if anyone's going to listen to this. So... Stick with basketball because, and the reason I tell about basketball is because I think I just want, I want to dive down every path that was important to me at some time. At that time I'm talking about, what was important to me? What did I believe to be true? What did I, what was I seeking? What was I going after? What was I feeling? And I hope that by sharing this, maybe there's something that people can learn about, about following dreams or about not following dreams or about giving up or not giving up or about loving someone or marrying someone or, or leaving someone or, you know, I, I just want to share the stories in case there is some value and, and you'll see this, the stories will go, there's no way that you, you can predict where, where these stories will lead. I mean, right now, let's face it, we're talking about childhood 
and a conservative family, how crazy can it really really be? If anything, my point is is just how absolutely normal I was, how all American white boy, um, you know, six six foot four. It's 196 centimeters or so, 197 centimeters. And um, I could do 360 dunks. I could shoot the three. I, I was I was like, you know, the jock. I didn't play football or, or baseball. I focused on basketball only. Um, as high school went on, I became, I guess, popular, although I didn't really know it. Um, I think my dad, my dad not having the social status, obviously the doctors and lawyers and the, the well-to-do kids, uh, didn't want much to do with me. They, they couldn't really, I couldn't date, you know, the banker's daughter or the doctor's daughter, even though I might have, I wanted to, they, but they wouldn't, they wouldn't be with me, even though, you know, I thought I, w- I was, <laughs> I thought I didn't see why, why that, I didn't really understand it at the time. Um, I was voted prom king. <laughs> That's kind of a funny story. A couple of winter fests and prom, or something, or something like that, two different, Different things. I had to wear that the crown on the head and have all the pictures taken. So, you know, it was fun. I was somebody in high school. I was in the newspaper all the time. If I went to McDonald's or Hardee's, uh, a lot of the sports fans, the adults, knew who I was exactly, and they they'd mention something about the game. And um, you know, basketball was it was so much fun. The the games you would just look forward to these games. Um, the, the, you know the away games. You take the yellow school bus and you and you're driving for an hour and you're having fun with the team and and it's Tuesday night and and it's late and you have these wild adventures, these last minute, uh, last second shots and to win the game or lose the game and all this stuff happens and then you come to school the next day and they and and you kind of feel like well everyone knows what I did last night or or on the contrary everyone knows that I sucked last night. In fact, nobody probably cared or very few people cared at all. Um, we, we weren't like a state level team that that you know we weren't like ranked or something. We were Division two, sort of like you know smaller school. And but it was so much fun. The games we had a, we had a band. We'd come out for warm ups and and they'd have the tr- the horns and the drums and and the crowd going crazy. And you're doing your warm ups and your drills and you're wearing this really cool white and blue. Uh, Warm up outfit and 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 uh, what's gonna happen? Am I gonna score thirty two? Are we gonna are we gonna blow this team out? What's gonna happen tonight? And my grandpa and grandma were sitting right there in the first row. He was like already eighty years years old in high school, uh, in his eighties. And my parents were up on the bleachers over there, and the classmates are over here. And it was just so much fun that it made all the work really worthwhile. Um. I didn't really believe anymore that I was probably going to go pro. I didn't think about it too much because I knew it was kind of a long shot. I would have to make some leaps forward. Um, and I don't I don't think that my coach was good enough. I don't have any coaching that was good enough to really guide me in the right direction. He wasn't close to me. I was his best player, but I think it was a snobby small town thing where my, my parents are nobody and... And then, and then of course the, the 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 owner of the car dealership or the or the, owner, or the bank the banker's daughter is calling. You know, I'm sorry, the banker's um, daughter. I'm thinking about the banker's daughter still. The banker's um, dad is calling in for you know why is my kid not playing and my kid doesn't touch the ball enough. So there was so many politics, and the team wouldn't pass me the ball. It got so bad. Because well, the other problem is, I, is as soon as I got the ball, I would just I would just shoot it. <laughs> so I wasn't being coached properly, right? Um, but, and then the practices were, were hard. I mean, it's grueling. It's, you're at school all day. I would get up early. I had a, I had, oh, this is an interesting story. I had a um, a car that my grandpa gave me. It was an Oldsmobile 90, it's Olds 98. Big old car, like one of these old Cadillac, like, you know, big, long, heavy, black car with, a, with an electric sunroof, electric windows, it was a 1979 model, and this was, we're talking about early 90s now, so we're talking about a, actually it's not that, it wasn't that old, but it was, you know, 12 or 13 years old. And leather seats. <laughs> and, and I'd get up in the morning early, set my alarm, and I'd go to the gym. They, they gave me a key, or a, they, I'm not sure how I got in, maybe the staff was already there or something, but 
I got in early and I did my shooting. I took a shower in the locker room before school. And then we'd have another practice after school because you got to do your shooting alone and keep that fresh. So I worked at it and, and practices, you know, grueling. I remember being sick and coughing up phlegm and, and just being exhausted. And then going out in the freezing cold in January and your hair freezing. I was going to the parking lot and my hair would freeze <laughs> after practice. Um, so it was, and it was all year round like that. You go to basketball camp in the summer, you go for like three or four days with three practices of three hours per day. You can't even walk the second and third day. And you're supposed to practice three hours again, three hours again, three times a day. So basketball camp was definitely not fun only because my body couldn't do it. I'd love to have just played. I, I would play basketball all day long, every day at some points in my life, but my, your body doesn't, doesn't agree with, <laughs> agree with that plan. And I guess I'll talk a little bit about, about my relationships in high school. And, and, and I'm sure you wouldn't be listening to this unless you've, unless this series goes forward and maybe there's some curiosity to come back at the beginning. Yeah, so you, you have your reasons why you're listening to my boring personal stories in high school, because certainly this, th these stories from my high school days are not going to be interest, really interesting to anyone other than to kind of set, you know, set the canvas, I guess, as to who I, who I am. Um, my first, I remember having a crush on a girl when I was in seventh or eighth grade when they started getting breasts and I started going through puberty and, and wow, that was some crazy, powerful attraction and feelings then. I remember that. And I, my first girlfriend was as a sophomore, um, skinny, really skinny, tall girl, basketball player. Her dad was the uh, teacher and um, I guess they were pretty patient that they let her date me they I by that time I had a driver's license already I was I was 16 already and I had I, I would drive my parents wait a minute what happened to my other car oh no I didn't get the black car until later until I was like 17 18 but in the first year I drove my parents kind of new car a GMC Jimmy and so that was pretty cool. I, I got I took my girlfriend out to the movies with, with and I you know, drove her, and we would I would park. <laughs> we would find a dead end and um, and do our thing. Um, didn't go all the way with her, but like everything else, we had a lot of fun. Uh, that a lot of exploring that and and um, it was not we were not mature enough soft as a sophomore. I, I I guess I didn't love her in the right way. It was kind of a fun thing. We were friends and. It was kind of goofy, and um, I finally broke up with her after after about nine months, I think, when she came to school with this with this perm, this curl, this brand new perm, this, these kind of country girl curls, and this ugly sweater, this weird like I think it was uh, brownish, really ugly beigeish sweater that I, maybe her mom made or something. I don't know, and. I just broke up with her. I said, you look like a country singer. <laughs> I was I was pretty mean, pretty insensitive, I guess, like I'm sure most 16-year-old guys are. And I didn't really have, I didn't have a relationship um, until, until I met Eva um, as a senior. And I'll, maybe I'll get to that shortly. Um, I remember as a freshman, I'm not sure if this is important, but also I'm trying to just share the memories that, that, that come up as a freshman, I was kind of friends with, with this, this guy, um, on the, on the team, not a serious player, but just on the team. And by the way, the friend, I didn't mention any, any interesting, I didn't mention any guy friends yet. That's really freaking interesting isn't it because back then your friends were everything and why didn't I mention any friends yet I mentioned family I mentioned my dreams I mentioned what I did now I my plans and what I did but I didn't mention my friends so let me back up a little bit I had 
I guess my, my friends were, were mostly around basketball because I think any friendship was really about a shared interest. Yeah, so my friends. I guess my first friend that I would I would that comes to mind is is Pete. He his dad was a his dad used to be a uh, pretty successful college basketball player. So naturally, Pete Pete was also very very interested in basketball and very tall and and he was my number one competition in like seventh grade. Eighth grade, we'd play one on one. He'd beat me sometimes. He was he's like the one guy that could beat me because he's tall. He was so tall. Um, we would I would go over to his house, and um, we'd also play some Nintendo. And I didn't have a, a, a game, a video game at that time. I had um, in television before that when it was just this is years before that. But at that time, I kind of decided it's a waste of time to have to be a gamer, but we'd go over there and he would play and, and he would, he'd eat his junk food and, and make, and fart and, and do silly, silly things that you do in seventh grade. And that was wonderful. Cause we thought we were going to be like going to state. Cause he was so good. And I was so good that, Hey, a big guy and a little bit smaller guy that can handle the ball. We were going to be a hell of a, of a varsity team. But I think the problem was that, that our, the varsity coach in Wapaka at that time, um, he just wasn't a very good coach or a good person. And I think Pete's dad saw that and didn't want, you know, he, he took Pete's future seriously. So they moved to Oshkosh and they went to a division one, uh, or I don't know how do you call it? Like the class a or, you know, the, the bigger town. And Pete actually did go on to play college ball at, uh, UW green Bay um, so he, I guess he succeeded in, 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 in the goal there, but I lost the friendship. I didn't, I, I kind of lost touch with him after they moved. Um, I did have a really good friend. I'm trying to remember how he even made friends. This is funny. How do you even make friends? But Brian, Brian was a very, very unique person very interesting he had been through a lot when he was a when he was young his his crib apparently broke and he fell out and he actually got injured so badly that his legs didn't quite work right he kind of walked funny and couldn't and he, i guess he had a lot of pain and he they i guess they sued the crib manufacturer and they got like a bunch of money and his dad kind of stole some of it from him and it just caused a lot of problems in his life this money but he was so much fun he was so funny he was just the funniest guy. He would. He, we had this. We had this thing in high school that he, he. We would just say dreams, dreams, and we would just whatever we, whatever we would, whatever we would want to do, we would just say dreams, and then we'd go do it. So, and I'm jumping around a little bit here. Brian was my friend, I guess, from seventh, eighth grade up through the end, well, end of high school. But like, for example, when we were seniors and close to graduating, we had this idea, let's go sleep on the roof of the, of the school. And we're going, you know, so we just picked, I got my boom box and we got some, some, some sheets or whatever blanket and went to the school and we're, and we're going to camp all night and, and be at school in the morning when the buses roll in. Well, we couldn't get to the roof because there's no, there's no way to get to the roof of a school, but we, so we just pulled up and, and under a tree and we just, you know, played music. I played, I played PM Dawn. Um, I loved PM Dawn at that time. And, um, and we just, we did it. We you know we just talked all night and laughed and giggled all night. And he would, he would just, he lived at a, on a lake and in the summers, man, he had this massive, Massive sound system, like professional, like concert sound system, and we would crank that up. We play U two Octung Baby album, and other stuff. Matthew Sweet and things like that. He showed me this stuff. He was a huge music fan, and we'd go to the middle of the lake, and turn it up so high that we could hear the music perfectly in the middle of the lake, <laughs> as the rest of the lake could as well. And his mom just kind of, his dad had left, and his mom just didn't care, so he was kind of free to do whatever he wanted to do. But he didn't drink, and I, I didn't drink. I didn't drink all the way through high school. We didn't party. I didn't go to parties. Um, for fun, we would drive around. 
I like before I had my license, we'd stay over at each other, people's house and and play games and stay up all night and eat candy and stuff like that. But when we had our driver's licenses, when some when some of us started getting them, um, we would drive around the town and just kind of get into trouble. We would we would go to Hardee's and then Dairy Queen and say, Hey, what's going on? What's going on? Much? What's going on with you? Hey, those guys are over there. Oh, let's go over there and check it out. See what they're up to. Oh, nothing, nothing. And once in a while, you get invited to a to a, someone's house and you feel like, well, maybe maybe there's not going to be a wild party or any drinking. I think we would even ask, is it going to be like a party or what? No, we're just watching movies. Oh, okay. So we come over to someone's house and watch movies. Or in the summer, I went, oh, God, the best. It was a couple times we would go to the lake and try to get the girls to go skinny dipping. Well, it doesn't, didn't really work. I think once or twice some of the guys did in the dark, but the girls wouldn't join us, so that didn't work out. But it was fun, so much fun. Um, but we would, we would drive around. I had Sometimes I had like seven or eight people in my, in my big black car when I finally had that. Uh, the sunroof wide open, or the moonroof, they called it. And we'd we'd stand up and, and shout and drive around a parking lot and just go wild. We would throw water balloons out the out the window at other car the people we know. Just get into trouble. Like I, I, I could have died so many times. Even in the winter, we'd go out there and do this crap. And really, it was so dangerous the way I... I mean, don't trust a 16-year-old guy with with a car. It just... We're crazy. I, I won't even... I mean, I, okay, I mean, one time, I wanted to see if it would fly. <laughs> I, I literally, on a, on a back road with some hills... I, I drove and I was like, what, what the hell are you doing? You're talking about a car that's not a sports car. You can't handle. I was going so fast. I thought, I'm going to fly a little bit. If it had flown, I would have fucking rolled the thing, right? I mean, what are you thinking? I, I'd go around corners sometimes. So, you know, I could I could roll the the SUV, you know, before that. And, I you know, I'd run stop signs. I'd do, we do car chases and stuff. It was just completely wild stuff. And bore, you know, you're not drinking, but but you're even getting into more trouble probably out there doing that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, a lot of my friends were probably at these wild parties and doing the drinking games or the field parties. I never did that stuff. I thought it was a dead end. It wasn't for me. I was this up and coming athlete. Guys on the team, and and, and Brian had some friends, Ted and Ed. Um, and we'd hang out, hang out, and just be so silly. Uh, they would sm- they would try smoking a pine needle c- cigarette just for fun. They'd make <laughs> smoking pine needles just for fun. Um, they would get together and, and watch Monday Night Football in the, in the garage and do a little setup there. Um, it was just wild, and there was so much energy. Um, I don't want to bore you with silly teenage stories, but it was laughs. It was just endless laughter. And and then the guys on the team, Chuck. Chuck was the funny one. He's just, you can't describe. Chuck is this big kind of dorky guy. And he couldn't catch the ball. You threw him the ball and it would just go through his hands and hit him in the hit him in the face in the middle of a game. Or or he, he was a little bit tall, so he'd get, he'd get a couple rebounds, but he'd keep missing. So he has like five shots and keep donk, donk. And when he was when he was in seventh, eighth grade, he was so bad. He would just he would throw up bricks and he would just camp out in the lane and get called for three second violations constantly <laughs> he'd, 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 oh he hit his head i did it again oh my god sorry so he wasn't very smart but and he, and he didn't smell very good he didn't take too many showers but he you know we're we were friends I, I don't know if i was laughing with him or laughing at him but we were friends we'd hang out a lot even just the two of us at his house or driving around in his old blue um station wagon you know um some of the other guys, I don't know. I was friends with you know Josh. He was out in the country. He had a farm, and we played basketball. He'd he showed me some. We'd we'd watch some, some um, R-rated movies and look for the part with the titties, and I don't know, just the typicals. I guess just typical stuff. Brian showed me how to mountain bike. So he, Brian's like, oh, let's go mountain bike. It's awesome. And and one time we camped in a tent on my on my family's property. We we had fifty acres of land, and we put a tent out in the woods and. And we had our, I had an older bike, and he had his brand new mountain bike, and with all his money, and he's like, "Let's go biking." It was like midnight. Dreams, right? So we actually went. Of course, we never had an idea and didn't do it. If you have an idea, go do it, right? So we went like really far, like for hours 
in the middle of the night through the forest, through a, through a, national, through a state park, on a trail in the woods in the middle of the night. And when I came back, I was like, I'm, I'm going to buy a mountain bike. <laughs> so sure enough, I, you know, that's my next goal. I, I, I had a couple odd jobs. I mowed grass. I, uh, later on, I worked in a gas station, you know, really part time. It was kind of interesting. Um, but I didn't really want to get too sucked into jobs because, um, I wouldn't have time for focus for, for basketball and for having fun. So I just basically made enough money to be able to pay for gas and, and a few things here and there. And my parents took care of my clothes and my, and my basketball shoes and all that. And things were fine. Um, there's a, there's a great feeling of camaraderie and any kind of team. I mean, you have relationships you see each other every day so i had a bunch of friends and of course just being the basketball you know the jock um i was everyone knew who i was and i knew everyone and i never i never appreciated it at the time you know you never quite imagine that one day you graduate and, and you don't ever see them again you don't have friendships like that ever again it's so wonderful to be part of a community and to have relationships and and yeah, your country's good. Your grades are good. Uh, you have your parents are together. Um, you have a car. You have gas in the tank and money in the bank. <laughs> and it's Friday night, baby. And we just won last night. Let's go party. Another another random story, which I think someone should actually make this into like. I don't know, a comedy or a, or a cartoon or something because it's so, I, I probably won't do it justice here, but I'll use his real name, Dan Scouten, because he's passed away since, but our bus driver. So we had this bus driver. And of course, in Wisconsin, if you don't know this, like how school buses work in the U.S., um, you have a, school, a bus route that goes like an hour and you pick up all the kids in the morning in the same order. And then at the end of the at the end of the school day, you, you go back in the reverse order um, and drop them off. And so you you spend a lot of time on the school bus, a couple hours a day, if, or at least an hour or so a day. And this guy was so funny. He would wear this the same red plaid shirt every day. Getting a big guy, of course, older guy, greasy hair, and he had this mirror. And he'd look up at us, and if anybody was misbehaving, he'd be like, Manny. Is that gum in your mouth? No, 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 Mr. Scout, it's not. Spit it out. It was like this. He's like, and, and someone in the back of the bus is like, sit down, and I'm coming to the back of the bus. He'd stop the bus and he'd come. He had this voice that was supposed to scare us, but we were just laughing about it. And we had this this whole culture, this whole like sort of set of jokes around this, this guy. And I think it would make an amazing show or a series just the school bus, right? Kids misbehaving, crazy stuff. High schoolers, burnouts in the back. Uh, little kids in the front. Uh, middle schoolers trying to sit where they shouldn't sit. Too close to the cool kids and the tough kids and the fights and the misbehavior. And this poor guy trying to drive the bus, trying to keep some some bit of control over things. But the more he would get it wound up and, Emily, you sit down or shut your mouth. And he'd, he'd be like this. And we would just laugh, you know, we'd just kind of hide under our seats and just laugh at him. And suddenly we're all making jokes and, and repeating things. He, one time, <laughs> when, <laughs> I think he was just, he was just, he was just taking a piss. Really, he was just having a lot of fun with us. We didn't know it. We thought he was serious. We were kind of scared of an adult yelling at us. But one time someone must have let, let one go. And he just had no worries. Like, who's burning sulfur? <laughs> Now, I didn't know the phrase burn and sulfur as, as, you know, farting at the time, but it's hilarious, right? I mean, he obviously had a sense of humor. And I, I, for years as an adult, well, since the internet came online, right, I saw, I was trying to look him up, like to get a picture of him in reality, because all I have is this memory of him. I have no idea what he really looked like. And it took literally just this year, I found his obituary. Dennis Scouten, and sure enough, that's his picture, and how his family loved him, and they and they all wear they all wore red flannel. They 
they showed a picture on his obituary, or it was on Facebook, or on Facebook. His daughter had, you know, when he passed away, they all got together and wore the red red flannel, and he apparently he was super educated. He had he had a college degree, and just didn't want anything to do with it, and just came back to being a bus driver and having a simple life. And being this tough guy bullying kids that really just made us laugh for so many years. So he was a legend, really. He was a legendary person and loved by everyone, every mature person who knew him. Could not talk about my childhood without mentioning mentioning my bus driver. Um, teachers, this is getting really boring. Uh, you know, God, I had a boring fifth grade teacher. He, he said He said the word whatnot all the time. What not? What? Just shut up. Stop saying what not. Um, high school. I was so I was really into like like English composition or English class. Um, I loved writing. I loved you know reading um, history. I liked history a lot and um, you know American all the stories about how great America was and all the the typical U.S. history and. Um, Trying to think of anything, anything else that's, that's important. Um, I guess what I'll do is I'll probably stop this this first this first talk here, and then I will get into kind of my transition into the next phase when I met my high school sweetheart, my exchange student from Slovakia, Eva, and fell madly, madly in love um, the summer before senior year. And what does that do to your plans as a normal jock trying to get to college? And that's, I didn't mention, like, the whole point of this was to get to college. My, you know, my dad, my dad was always talking about getting to college, and he didn't, they didn't have the money, the means to, to send me to college or pay for it. So he got in his head that the only way that I was going to go to college and ever have money and have a great, you know, life that he, that he couldn't have would be if I were to obviously go to college. Well, the only way to do that was to get a scholarship. So basketball scholarship. I wasn't going to be a genius, a straight A student. Um, so basketball was the way. And so that's why he was always encouraging me to play basketball is, is for college. And so that was my, my number one goal. I don't think at some point it wasn't NBA anymore. It was just getting getting to college. Um, pro, and then at some point it wasn't even Division One college. I knew I wasn't good enough to, to go to you know UW Madison or something like that. So um, could I get to Division Two, II, Division Three, where I get a scholarship and pay for college? Hey, that was a win. You know, I get uh, I I figured I'd keep playing basketball and and um, get an education and, and and it'd be great. Didn't give it much thought what what it would actually be like or where I would go or how that would work out. Um, and and didn't know. I didn't know until senior year whether. I was going to college or not. And so senior year, I guess we started, they started the recruiting stuff and everything. And I think it was not until, um, I think uh, after, you know, the new year, after Christmas, so the later part of the season, when I started to really know what what, I, what my plans actually were for college. And I'll get to that later. Um, you know, I feel good. I'll, I'll keep going a little bit. A little bit tired today, actually. I didn't, I, like I said, I drank a little bit too much last night, which I need to work on that a little bit. Um, it sucks when you, you know, when you take away anything from the next day. But I, I like, oh, we'll get to that. I guess I don't want to, I don't want to speed ahead. Let's just talk about Eva. <laughs> um... You know, by the time you're a senior in high school, you you know everybody really well. You know all the girls. They know you. You really can't make a move on a lot of the girls because they've already already decided they're not going to date you, or you know, you, you may maybe you blew it years years before, and they don't like you anymore. So not much is happening. Uh, there was this one prom date that I kind of really had a huge crush on, and a, kind of a physical crush, not like you know we didn't have much in common. But it, didn't, it never really went anywhere. Well, actually, it did. I actually talk about another story. Um, I was, like I said, it was too much physical attraction, so I wasn't treating her very well. I'd moved too fast with things. And I remember one... I 
It was one summer. She went to my church. And I won't give it, I guess I won't give a name for this one. It's not that important. But um, we were going to hang out after church. You know, we, we had spent a couple days together. I wouldn't call them dates, but we hung out at someone's house and we knew that we liked each other and all this. We, went to the, we were going to go to the beach. We did go to the beach, actually. There was this place called Wolf, Wolf Lake, which was beautiful sandy beach, small lake out there in the middle of nowhere. And we came back to my, to my house and we took a walk down to the bridge. And I made my move, you know. It's kind of boring details, but okay, I made a pretty, not, it wasn't an aggressive move, but it was a move. Kissed and, and a bit more than that. And I remember she was wearing a baseball cap. Uh, Oklahoma Sooners, was it? No, it was, gosh, what team was it? It doesn't really matter, I guess. But it was a baseball cap of a college team. And she, and she gave it to me. And I thought everything was fine. We held hands. She went home and then I tried calling the next day and the next day after that and the next day after that and her parents wouldn't tell me why she wasn't calling me back or where she was or anything. And after some time, I just thought like, I guess she doesn't want to talk to me or see me. So I stopped trying to reach her. And it wasn't until a month or a month and a half later that I found out that the, that the very next that that night, she tried to she tried to commit suicide. Um, she swam to the middle of the lake and tried to drown herself and took pills and everything else, and she was in the she was in the um, well they told me she had uh, she they finally told me that she had gone to her grandparents' house in Minnesota but that wasn't true she was in the hospital she was getting care. So, I mean, I had to live with the fact that something, did I, was it my fault? Did something, did something I do lead her to try to commit suicide for holding her hand and kissing her? And, and I, I, we went to church, we went to the beach, we had a little thing there, and I was like super excited about going forward with her. And suddenly she tried to commit suicide the very same day. Well, it can't be unrelated, right? So I don't know, and I don't know the story. I never found out the story about, about her. But she was also my... Even after that happened, she, we 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 were prom dates, so we still had some kind of connection, but it just never worked. She was not she was unable to have a relationship, I guess, at that time. And I will stop here, and we'll start with meeting meeting Eva as the next talk.